Japanese advance on the national capital paves the way directly for the tragedy of the Panay. Shanghai captured, the Nipponese invaders strike westward with incredible speed and soon are pouring shells and air bombs into Nanking. The defenders bravely ignore a Japanese ultimatum calling on them to surrender. Despite the deadly peril, Norman Alley takes his stand in the besieged city, recording the ruin of war amid the constant rain of steel and high explosives that takes hundreds of lives and lights grisly fires throughout the capital. The Japanese force the Kung Wa Gate, but the bodies of China's soldiers and civilians bear grim testimony to the bitterness of their opposition. The city is ringed by the glow of a hundred flames that seem funeral pyres in honor of the heroic or the helpless dead. The invaders scale the walls at night, planting machine guns and light artillery that rake the town by day. Horror piles upon horror, and one pitiful scene surpasses another. Military chance lulls in the hail of death. The war-shocked population salvages the pitiful remnants of its shattered homes. Death struck even in the so-called safety zone, where 300,000 people huddled in fear. That man carries the body of his child, clinging dumbly to the forlorn hope that life still inhabits its shattered little body. Day after day, the fury of war sends new hordes from corner to corner, laden with rags and tatters of their broken lives. Standing offshore from the doomed city is the United States gunboat Penai. Of the Yangtze Patrol, our officers anxiously scanning the waterfront for signs of American refugees. The Penai is the only haven of safety left to Americans trapped in the burning and besieged Chinese capital. Lieutenant Commander Hughes, the officer pointing, and his subordinates, Lieutenants Geist, Anders, Grazier, and Ensign Bewers, are destined in a few hours to add a new chapter to American naval heroism, along with the ship's crew, including these picturesque Whiskerinos. This form of facial adornment is quite unusual in the United States Navy. It is a special mark of distinction on the Yangtze Patrol. These jolly fellows little know what's in store for them. Wounds, hardships, and for some, sudden death. <laughs> Fleeing from the beleaguered city, a number of Americans and others arrive at the riverside, hoping to get aboard the Panay. Newspaper men and newsreel men who have remained to the last. Ironically enough, there to find that their feeling of security under the stars and stripes is destined to become a mockery. Among the little group is Sandro Sandri, an Italian correspondent who is destined to meet death aboard the Penai. Weldon James, frantically waving his handkerchief, finally attracts the attention of a lookout, and help is soon on the way. Captain Hughes personally takes command of the launch that goes to the succor of the correspondents. Stars and stripes are prominently displayed on the small boat speeding to the rescue of the refugees. The fire in the city is spreading rapidly, and now the captain aims to evacuate every American from the danger zone immediately. And here you may see even more closely how prominently the American flag was flown as it was at all times during this international incident. Captain Hughes and his crew are a welcome sight to these newspaper men. Journalists who know war in all its modern horror, its brutality, and its relentlessness. So now to board the Panay, and what they thought would be complete safety. But it means a short trip to death for one of these newspaper men, and days of horror for the others. A few short hours after they were aboard, the ill-starred Panay is to steam up the river to a fatal rendezvous. Nothing now, however, beclouds their welcome surcease from the Nanking carnage.
tires are bright this Sunday morning, and danger seems to drop behind with every foot of progress the launch makes towards the gunboat in the stream. As the troubled shoreline recedes, there is the glint of sunshine on the water and on the flags that mark the Panay's nation. The American gunboat is a sort of naturalized citizen, for she was built in China, but constructed expressly for the use of the United States government's Yangtze Patrol, which guards American interests long recognized by treaty. Newspaper men once more set foot on what to most of them is home territory. Jim Marshall of Collier's Magazine is there, and Weldon James of the United Press. Two Italian newspaper men accompany the Americans. Preparations are rushed to evacuate the American embassy in Nanking. Diplomats representing the United States government suspend their difficult tasks for a while at least pack important state papers and head for the Panay in cars prominently marked with the American colors. Those on board the Panay extend them a helping hand and a genuine welcome as the officials step upon the vessel's deck. A picturesque figure is bearded J. Paxton Hall, second secretary of the deserted embassy. What a precious freight the Yangtze patrol ship carries now. Besides her normal complement of 55 officers and men are members of the embassy staff and the refugees who seek shelter on her armored decks. They should be safe here, all of them, under the protection of the American flag and the old established treaties that give that flag certain rights in these difficult waters. Japanese planes and artillery fire make the vicinity of Nanking a place of danger, even for neutral vessels in midstream. So Commander Hughes of the Panay decides to pull upstream. And soon, radio messages and other signals are flying between the Panay and nearby vessels, including the British riverboat Ladybird, also here on a relief mission. Commander Hughes and the skipper of the Ladybird necessarily have to work in close cooperation as representatives of their respective governments in these war-torn waters. Finally, the Panay sends up her flag signals to tell the world she's getting away from the inferno that is Nanking. So it's anchors away. The Panay moves up the river, leading the way as a mother ship for various other American craft in the vicinity. She's to act as convoy for several standard oil tankers and freighters. In far off Cafe, carries on in her double mission of mercy and national prestige. <laughs>